I wanted to just sort of share my basic approach to management that very simply, uh, and it's just this paradigm, it's not just CFS, but it's these patients that come in in this big group of, of CFS and fibro, and essentially it is to treat all identifiable medical conditions, you know, do your job as a clinician, teach the patients to pace their activity level, to avoid symptom flares, pacing is very important, learning how to uh, just control symptoms with activity. And then I have what I call the four legs of the table, uh, which are restorative sleep, thinking about mental health and stress management, controlling severe pain, and physical conditioning. And I treat, even though I'm a fatigue clinic, I, could, I treat fatigue last. I really treat fatigue indirectly. Uh, and sometimes I'll apply medications that I think might help augment fatigue, but I treat fatigue by treating the things I think contribute to fatigue first and then beware of medication and side effects. So I just wanted to give you that little structure, maybe a little pearl about how you might uh, manage patients. And there's my picture of the table that I'll leave you with. Very quickly, I thought I would mention uh, differential diagnosis of someone who comes in with widespread pain. We're not going to elaborate on this, just as a structure for looking at things. Um, okay, person comes in with widespread pain. I think the comorbidities of fibro are very useful. What I mean by that is disorders related to nervous system hypersensitization and augmentation that are very common along with fibro. For example, irritable bowel syndrome, not a colon disease, but in a nervous system over responding to gut signals or migraine headache over responding to light and sound or anxiety over responding to stress. The reason I put those up there, or irritable bladder, the reason I put those up there is if none of those are there, now they're not part of the official criteria, but if none of them are there, with widespread pain, then I may well look at some of the other less common causes of chronic pain. Uh, so if you've got the comorbidities and the tender points, you're very likely, this is very likely to be fibromyalgia in my estimation. Uh, if there are none of the comorbidities, IBS, migraine, anxiety, et cetera, and you do have tender points, then be sure you want to check on TSH, because hypothyroidism can cause chronic widespread pain. If the comorbidities are not there, IBS, etc., and you don't have tender points of great significance, then a SED rate is very useful to look for inflammatory disorders, and you want to look for if they have a poor sunlight exposure, so SED rate is negative, no inflammation, poor sun exposure. Look carefully for vitamin D deficiency. And a lot of people are vitamin D, including fibro patients have vitamin D deficiency, but they usually don't have all the comorbidities. They don't like get IBS and migraine, and the tender points aren't as striking. Again, negative tender points, negative comorbidities, but a high SED rate suggesting inflammation or CRP Okay, if people have the high SED rate, uh, again, an older person with a high SED rate, think of polymyalgia rheumatica. But polymyalgia rheumatica patients don't usually get a lot of the IBS and migraines and comorbidities, and their tender points aren't as striking. Uh, a high SED rate with weakness, then check a CK for the possibility of polymyositis. So that's sort of the differential diagnosis, I think, that's very useful. And while the comorbidities are not particularly part of the, co the, the criteria, they're a very helpful guideline to me uh, to, to explain this. This doesn't show up very well on, in your charts, yes? Well, we're sun phobic. Uh, America, if you go out in the sun with, uh, you know, preventive things to keep you from getting. Uh, uh, 
Um, well, that may go beyond our discussion here today, but the fact is a lot of people are suddenly, we did a study, uh, fibromyalgia people, full criteria, 70% were vitamin D deficient, and the vitamin D deficiency pain can then trigger the fibromyalgia in a person that's genetically prone to sensitize. So just, it's, a, it's well worth checking at 25 hydroxy vitamin D in all of people with widespread pain. Uh, one other quick little summary, the, these pathways, pain signal coming into the cord, going to the brain, inhibitory tracts coming down, they're kind of, we've heard uh, several uh, categories of treatment, the anticonvulsants block the signals going up, the deep sleep treatment is a key point of treatment, the norepinephrine serotonin reuptake inhibitors for the problems with norepinephrine, serotonin, the dopamine agonists for all the reasons Dr. Wood gave us, the anticonvulsants and the dopamine agonists may well help with the deep sleep problem. And if present, these folks not only get tender points, but they tend to get more trigger points, not little knots out in the periphery that then become a pain generator. And that doesn't respond very well to pills. Sometimes you have to treat that locally. It's not part of the syndrome, but they just tend to get more of these little local trigger points as well. So I just put that up as kind of a framework for some of the questions that, that we might talk about. Uh, uh, and then a quick summary, non-pharmacological issues, good evidence for education, for paced exercise, for some types of psychotherapy, most of the data is cognitive behavioral, but I'll be interested in what Dr. Drescher says as to whether that's the best in that category. Some evidence for things like biofeedback, hypnosis, minimal evidence for some of these uh, issues down here in studies that have been done. Uh, all of this should be in, in your handout, so I just put this up as a framework to help some of the questions. Uh, where should we begin? Uh, maybe just a general, yes? I passed out the questions to a few people. Okay, so questions are across the board, and I have a bunch up here as well. Uh, you've mentioned overlapping symptoms between chronic fatigue syndrome criteria and fibromyalgia. Are they the same thing? Uh, how are they different in terms of genetics, or how do you, uh, what, what's going on there? Are they, if we've got several forms of chronic fatigue syndrome and several forms of fibromyalgia, how, do, how does all that overlap? Well, as I said, it's, it's my conviction that there are several things that produce what we call the phenotype that is fibromyalgia, the, the widespread pain and the, and the tenderness. Now, with the new diagnostic criteria, we've, we've exploded that even further. I actually think it's a step backwards, uh, the new criteria. Um, and, and so if there, are, if there are many fibromyalgias with, with many roads that lead to Rome, if there are four or five in fibromyalgia, my, my impression, and I'd love to hear from the chronic fatigue community on this, I've always said if there's five fibromyalgias, there's, there's 50 chronic fatigues. Because there's so many pathways that lead to that. I, and if, I find it very intriguing that XMRV may be highly prevalent, and I'd like to know, I'm, a, I'm big on mechanisms, so pain mechanisms and, and symptom expression. Um, but I think that's where the overlap comes from, is this idea that these different pathophysiologies that can produce a symptom class. Um, I actually got started really early in my fibromyalgia uh, career. I, I read um, Oliver Sacks' Awakenings, which was a post, uh, the story of a post-viral Parkinsonism. And as I read the case studies, they just seemed like caricatures of my, my fibromyalgia patients, like fibromyalgia you know, to the 10th degree. I became interested in Parkinsonism. And, and so I'm sure that there are various viruses that, that attack various areas of the brain and spinal cord that produce these symptom classes um, that, that may be undetectable at this time. I'd like to say that as an organization, we've made an effort every year to do a conference that spans CFS and fibro specifically because it's difficult to separate. And even among members of our board, we've had strong disagreement about whether or not we should lump or split. 
And the way I look at this is these case definitions are a tool for us to identify a group of patients who are ill. And fibromyalgia defines people by their widespread pain, oh, plus they have all these other symptoms. And the chronic fatigue syndrome definition defines people by debilitating fatigue and, oh, they have all these other symptoms. The research case definition for CFS requires that you exclude every other illness that might be contributing and not count, you know, not study the patient if they have overlapping uh, and contributing symptoms. The fibromyalgia definition doesn't do that. It really allows you to uh, frame, you know, have a working uh, diagnosis and begin to exclude and do a differential diagnosis. But you can, if the patient meets the criteria, they have, they meet criteria for fibromyalgia syndrome. So it's, it's much more user friendly in the clinic. We tend to adapt the CFS case definition to the clinical setting uh, by allowing more comorbidities because we try to treat them and compensate for them. So I, I would, at this point, what we need, this was one reason I, I tried to make the focus on science here at this clinic, is we do, excuse me, at this conference, is we do need to begin to subset uh, these, uh, these uh, different disorders. Unfortunately, you have to use your clinical tuition, intuition right now to do that uh, out in the field. Yes, but you can do it clinically. You can work on these uh, subset issues. What, what I do is I rotate the codes. So every patient's got like four or five or six codes, right, if you think about their comorbidities. You tend to focus on one or another when they come in. So I don't always put fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome as their primary diagnosis, even if I consider it that, when I'm billing. So uh, whatever I focus on, I, I prioritize, and, and I haven't really had any trouble in terms of billing. So this one says, how is XMRV transmitted? Um, the answer is we really don't know. So it's a retrovirus, and there are two other retroviruses that we do understand something about, HIV and HTLV-1. Both of those are transmitted by exchange of body fluids. So um, either via blood transfusion, by sexual activity, or by maternal to child transmission during childbirth. Uh, we do not know if any of these uh, mechanisms are prevalent in XMRV transmission. What we are doing is we're studying um, certain samples. Um, so we're looking at blood from the general population. We're looking at seminal fluid, and we're looking at cervical secretions. But those are ongoing studies, and we don't know. We don't have the answers yet. Yes? Right, so, so you can either explain a maternal to child, you know, so acquisition of the virus at birth, or, you know, there might be other ways of uh, getting it. So, yeah, the, the, so Cindy's asking if anyone's looked at XMRV in children, and to my knowledge, no, no one's looked at XMRV in kids. But there, there is, of course, chronic fatigue syndrome in kids, which often gets diagnosed around puberty or later, um, but it's definitely there. 